Uh, let's dive into it. We've been in a book study on 1 Peter. So we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8. And we're going to read verses 8 through, let me see, 22. Finally, all of you, who's all of you? All of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, and a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless... For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you even if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make an offense to anyone who has asked you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, not if you are slandered, when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing for evil." Then we have this example that's given in verse number 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteousness, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. He concludes baptism which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels and powers having been subjected to him. Heavenly Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to help. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Amen. We're going to start at the end of this passage because I think it's very powerful that you understand how controversial or problematic the last three or four verses in this passage were. When Peter, which is really the one of the only times it's said in Scripture, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. We know that reading the totality of Scripture, that faith in Jesus, Romans 10, 9, and then is belief and confession in your heart. Some of the questions that you'll ask be asked in Bible college is, At what point is a person saved? Do they have to believe in their heart, confess with their mouth? Practically speaking, if I were to give you the most wonderful sermon of all time and and the Lord was going to move and the anointing was going to flow and the revelation to be born again was brought to you, and in the middle of you getting ready to respond, you had a heart attack and died, would you be saved? It's a good question, isn't it? At what point does a person become saved? At what point does a person that is lost become found? Is it an instantaneous thing? Is it a moment by moment thing? And Peter, he begins to talk about from his own life experience how important public confessing of your faith is. So you guys know Peter, right? Peter, the guy who um, had a sword and chopped off a soldier's ear. Peter who said, Lord, I'll never deny you, ended up denying him three times. That Peter, he learned so many important lessons about his faith And when Jesus said, Peter, if you love me, you'll feed my sheep, he wanted you to know how important it was for you not to be a camouflage Christian. What he's saying in this this scripture, I believe in hearing his heart, some of the most problematic scriptures in 1 Peter is, starting at the end here of this passage of scripture, then we're going to work backwards, is it is impossible for you to be a casual, camouflaged Christian. I don't think he was necessarily talking about the essence of salvation as if you're going to serve God, you can't have one foot in the world and then one foot in him. Because why? There's going to come a shaking and your true motive and your true decision is actually going to be seen. Are you guys tracking with me this morning? All right, we're going to dive into this. It's going to be a powerful word. So several weeks ago, we talked about the fateful five. The fateful five is malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Peter says, that if you, if you want to walk in as a collective, as a church, moving in the spirit, answering the call of God that God has on your life, you're going to have to get rid 
of the faithful five. You're going to have to get rid of all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, and all slander. Malice, we learn, is a hurt that's inside of you that wants to hurt. you got to get rid of deceit or concealment or distortion of who you really are. We talked about one of the greatest forms of deceit that happens in the body of Christ is when a brother or sister in Christ asks you how you're doing, and if you're doing bad, you say good, and if you're doing good, you say bad. We oftentimes don't even know how we're walking in deceit, but concealment or distortion of how you really feel is something that you're going to have to put to the side. He says you're going to have to get rid of hypocrisy or pretending to be one thing when you're really not. You're going to have to get rid of envy, a feeling of being overlooked, unwanted, unappreciated. You're going to have to stop being envious about someone else's victory while you're still in process of learning how to get yours. You're going to have to get rid of slander or the accusations based upon a rumor. How many think that gossip and slander need to leave the church? Wave, wave, give me the whole Pentecostal wave, yeah. But these five things, these faithful five things need to be replaced. And I'm going to give you a kingdom principle here as we start this lesson that is going to be so powerful for you to understand, especially you that are new believers. One is God will never ask you to give up something without, without promising you to give something in return that's going to be greater. God doesn't actually ask you to give up something to leave you empty or more empty than you currently are. No, he asks you to have an exchange. And and Peter writes, you need to get rid of the faithful five so that you can put on the healthy five. The older I get, the more I I walk in in, in church life, the more I walk in kingdom business, I want to be part of a healthy family that actually understands how to get rid of the faithful five and put on the healthy five. But if you're not careful, all you'll think of God in your relationship is what I'm having to put off, the no's that I'm given, not the yeses. The Bible says that all of his promises are yes and amen. Meaning if all you ever know about God is the rules on not what to do, you don't even really know the heart of God. And Peter, what he encapsulates very well in this this opening scripture in verse 8, he says, I've told you what to put off, now I'm going to tell you what to put on. And I like how he replaces the five with the five. He says you're going to get rid of malice or a hurt that wants to hurt, a hurt that doesn't understand, has ill feelings, ill intentions, doesn't understand why someone else can walk in victory when I'm walking in defeat. You're going to get rid of malice and you're going to put on unity. You're going to learn what it means to be like-minded. You're going to learn what it means to have the ability to rejoice when someone's rejoicing to have sorrow when someone's having sorrow, to be able to be so like-minded that you know that when a brother or sister in, your, in the faith in your family is hurting, you're going to be so like-minded that you're not going to have to question or wonder what's going on, but there is going to be a unity and togetherness that's going to be there. So put off malice and put on unity. How many think unity in the body of Christ is an important thing? Unity is not unanimity. It doesn't mean that we all have to be robots and be the same. Like, like C.W., when he was talking about the, the, the package for the curling iron, I completely understood the need for that because when I curl my hair in the morning, <laughs> some of you were with me, right? Like, we're on the same page there. I brush my hair still. I don't know why, but I brush my hair sometimes because it feels good on the bald scalp, I guess. I don't know. But putting off, putting off malice and then going towards unity is something that we have to learn as the body of Christ. And not everybody is going to be the same as you, but you can be together and celebrating the diversity and giftings, not of character, that's found in the body of Christ. He says you're going to have to take off deceit, and you're going to have to learn what it means to be sympathetic. My wife and I, it was the first time that we had been new to a congregation in almost two decades. We were the youth and young adult pastors, as many of you know, in Vacaville for 20-something years, 20-plus years. When we came to Parkway, Parkway was so friendly, so welcoming, but there was an adjustment season that needed to happen because how many know it's a really good feeling when you're around your people? When you've got people that you know that you're not walking up to a conversation and you're like not on the inside of the joke or inside of the story. For almost two years now, we have been slowly like inching to where like we can get next to people in conversation and go, oh yeah, we've got shared stories and experiences. And my people. And so what what Peter is saying is instead of walking into deceit where no one actually knows anybody, no one knows your struggles, your issues, your problems, your victories, 
your, your promotions, the things that you're doing well, the things you're doing. Instead of walking into seat, how about you join a congregation or a family of people that know you enough to know that no matter what you're going through, we have your back. We have your back in mountains high. We have your back in valleys low. There's not going to be an issue that you're going to have to walk in shame or guilt. Now, we'll bring correction. We'll tell you to stop doing that. But to be a part of a family of God is to put away deceit and then to walk in this opportunity to be sympathetic with a believer or someone on the other side. He says, so you got to get rid of the third thing. you got to get rid of hypocrisy or this pretending and you're going to put on this, one translation says, brotherly love. You're going to learn how, what it really means to love one another. That, that the church isn't just your family when things are going good. The church is your family when things are going bad. And you're going to learn how to walk through seasons of life as a congregation or a family where things that are happening are going to, some of, them, some of the time they're going to be things that you agree with and you like. And some of the times there are going to be seasons where you're having trouble understanding and trouble understanding what's actually going on. But Peter says, if you want to walk in health, have the kind of brotherly bond that gets rid of any kind of pretending. Look to your neighbor and say, stop pretending. Just stop pretending. The fourth thing, he says, you're going to have to get rid of envy, a feeling of being overlooked, and you're going to replace that with a feeling of compassion. Envy is about me. Compassion is about somebody else. Uh, I heard the, uh, the, the story of, of two churchgoers that started going to the church at the same time. And, one, and they, they sat next to each other for almost four, four Sundays. And on the fourth Sunday, one of the church uh, member or attenders that was trying to figure out if this was their church, they said to themselves, if someone doesn't reach out to me, then I, I, I'm not coming back here because it doesn't feel like family. The second church member or the attender said, I realize that there's something wrong in me that I can't make a friend, so I'm going to now actually reach out and I'm going to introduce myself to somebody. And it was in that moment where the, the person took it the right way that a need was met. And that's what Peter is saying. If you want to know the successful key to living a Christian life is to be a blessing, and in being a blessing, you're going to be blessed. So look to your neighbor and say, hi, how are you doing today? You doing good today? It's nice to meet you. It's good, it's good to have you in church today. Many people feel overlooked, and Peter says you're not going to be a victim anymore, and you're not going to walk in envy, but now you're going to walk in compassion. He says you're not going to walk in the fifth thing. You're not going to walk in slander, but now you're going to walk in humility. But for the grace of God, but for the grace of God, but from the grace of God, we are all sinners. And if we don't understand what it means to walk in humility, we're going to talk about this in a few moments, the church is not going to actually be able to, to, to see the victory that's been promised. Uh, let me talk about the gap here. You guys just lock in with me for a minute as I, as I pastor explain here really quick, all right? To walk away from the things that the Lord wants you to walk away from, the faithful five as I've dubbed them, to walk to the healthy five, there is this gap. And some people's gap is a lot longer than other people's gap. There are some, there are some people that get saved and, and God does a transforming work in them and they're all in and they close this gap really quickly. And then there are others of you, me, you, me, you, that it takes us like a turtle and saved for 10 years and we're still envious of somebody else. Takes us five years and we're still envious of the, what God's doing in the other church in town. We're, we're, we're well, no one actually, actually asked me how I was doing today. And we walk this slow pace to the transforming place that God wants us to live because we don't understand that the new identity that we're supposed to have in Christ is a lot more fulfilling than the old identity that we had in the world. And so the, clo the faster that you can close the gap from the faithful five to the healthy five, the faithful five to the healthy five, the quicker that you can close that gap, the less time the enemy has in your life, in your ear, talking about the things that you're not, and the closer that you get to impact. So listen to me. If I've never told you any kind of kingdom principle or, or, or skill that you need to learn, 
is to be quick. When God tells you through Scripture to change something, change it. Because on that side is a much more fulfilled, wonderful Christian walk than getting stuck over there. So this gap. So, Pastor, how do I close this gap? I don't want to be envious. I don't want to slander. I don't want to gossip. I don't want to walk in deceit. But it feels like all the time I'm just struggling with my, my own emotions. And I'm going to introduce to you a word that's going to be very important for you to understand and relearn. You ready for it? It's called repentance. Got to repent. Repent means to turn from. It means that I'm going to make an intentional decision not to put the old man on me, but I'm going to begin to walk and become the new creation in Christ that he's called me to be. So rather than be envious, I'm going to bless. I, rem I remember there was this distinct moment in my Christian walk. Um, I had been on staff at, at, the, at my home church in, in Vacaville for almost 10 years. We started in an a, in a, a elementary school gymnasium. And we were just in a struggle of trying to get the church going and preaching the gospel and, and winning people to Jesus. And we came shortly after they moved into a downtown location building. I had this wonderful, just, man, this pure call of God to be in ministry. And there wasn't nothing that I wasn't willing to do or sacrifice or be a part of. It was this genuine, insatiable desire to be part of a kingdom-moving church. And I remember that lasted. And I, there was this moment of confrontation that the Lord was bringing me to that in the first eight or nine years I was in Vacaville, I had been brought on staff and laid off seven different times. So we're going to, by faith, hire you as a youth pastor. And when I say hire you as a youth pastor, it was like fourteen or $1,800 a month. And it was, you know, beans and rice and everything nice. And it was just this dream that we were living, you know. And so we would, we would, we would by faith, we're going to get on. And about the sixth or seventh time, because I'm a slow learner, I started to get a little offended. So I'm, I'm a slow learner when it comes the other way, right? I started getting a little mad, a little upset. And I remember calling my dad and I'm like, the church just bought like five flat screen TVs to put in the, in the sanctuary and here they are laying me off again. And my, my dad being so wise and, and so understanding kingdom principles, he looked at me and he said, son, make sure that you are quick to forgive and quick to understand what someone else is going through because if you let that thing fester on the inside of you, you are going to be separated from the mission field that you're actually called to reach. So my dad gave me this kingdom principle. He said, you're going to bless those. You're going to bless those even though you don't feel like, you, you, you feel like you've been overlooked. And so here's what you're going to do. You're going to get on your knees. And I remember my dad was so clear on this. He said, put, you, put me on speakerphone. And I put him on speakerphone. And he goes, I want you to get on your knees right now in your living room. And I'm like, how dare you, dad, tell this grown man what to do? And he goes, no, I'm serious. You get down on your knees. And he goes, you're not, I'm not hanging up until I hear a tear coming down your cheek about how, you much, how much you love your pastor and how much you're believing in him and how much you're... And I was like, when I first started praying, I was like, Lord, would you just teach that pastor a few lessons? <laughs> teach him how to treat people and, you know, those kinds of prayers. And I remember this, this man, this heart began to come, come to me as I began to pray for my pastor in a way that I have never done. Because it, since then... He had always done good. He had always done good by me. But the moment that I had the opportunity to have a fence to be part of my life, the enemy wanted to wedge that in, in there because there was, a, there was a real reason I could be upset. So I, I literally, man, began to shed tears and say, Lord, I don't know what my pastor's going through. I don't know the decisions that he's having to make. I don't know what finances are happening behind the closed doors. I don't know if that was designated money that needed to be spent in a certain way. God, I just want to serve you and I want to honor my pastor. And I began to cry out for my pastor. Like legitimately, tears streaming down my face. Thank you, Lord, that you've brought someone in my life. And I, this, this heart of humility and gratitude began to well up, and I began to tear up. And my dad said, son, I'm so proud of you. Now the second thing you're going to do is you're going to give to him until it hurts. And you're not going to give to him to the church. You're going to give to him personally. And I was like, say what? <laughs> this man just laid me off. I think I had $120-something in my bank account. You're going to give. And you're going to bless, and you're going to learn that in blessing, you're going to receive a kingdom principle of what it means to actually walk in a healthy manner. Some of you guys are, I know are having the same kinds of problems with this kind of talk that I did back then, but I want you to understand the biblical principle of learning what it means to be part of a family and walking healthy. Peter, Peter writes, he says, you're going to have to learn how to bless 
Because when you bless, you're going to obtain a blessing. If I come to the church and, and my attitude is, what's in it for me? At the end of that road is a victim mentality. But when I come to church and I say, man, who can I bless today? Whose life can I be a part of? How, how can I find a place of service? It's why it's so powerful listening to the missionary Aaron and CW today. Because they have learned the kingdom principle of what it actually means to get rid of the faithful five when, when church and Christianity is all about me and put on the healthy five when I say, Lord, you've already done so much for me. How can I be a blessing to those people around me? So you, you have an opportunity today. The Lord doesn't just put you or give you an empty hand or ask you for an exchange without putting something on the other side of it. So you, you have an opportunity today to put on the healthy five. Look to your neighbor and say, you're going to be a new you tomorrow. You're going to be a new you tomorrow. You're going to learn what it means to be like-minded. You're going to learn what it means to walk in unity and sympathetic and love for one another. Here's what A.W. A. Tozer said about unity or being like-minded. Here's what he says. He says, unity comes not through uniformity, but through each individual as different as he may be from the others, turning his gaze steadily upon the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. Unity comes not from a common language or nationality or race or color or political agenda, but from a common vision and posture as we all with unveiled face behold the glory of God and bow the knee before him. When you see Jesus and you see him and he is the center of your life, there is something in you that says less of me and more of him. If church and your believer and your Christian life has always been surrendered by, how am I getting filled? What's happening to me? Am I, am I being sought after or, or looked after? No. If you will learn the kingdom principle of saying, Lord, I trust you that you're going to take care of me as I pour my life out in service to others because when I bless, when I create the blessing flow of my life, when I am the first to bless others, that is when I, in turn, am blessed. You know that one part harmony can never be harmony? I don't know. Have you guys ever heard my singing voice? I don't think you want to hear it. Now, I could rap. I could, you guys want me to rap? No, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that either. I want to have a church next week. You really got the best deal with my wife because my wife is just an anointed woman of God. She can just, she don't mess around. But there are times when I am driving down the road, I'll look to her and go, do you want me to give you a singing lesson? We, we uh, years ago, were going through a drive through and, and one of the kids meals that we got for one of the guys, it was like an America's Got Talent uh, uh, kids meal and it said uh, four steps to learn how to sing. And for two hours, I tried to follow the steps, one, two, three, and four. And um, I was worse at the end of it than I was at the beginning of it. I have begged my wife just to be like, please teach me how to sing. And she'll go, just, it's not your gift. Just, <laughs> just sorry. What I do know in, in watching my wife work with so many worship leaders and, and band members and people, um, one, of the, one of the most vivid memories that comes to mind is when she was teaching somebody to get the right note, and she would just play it on the keyboard, and then they would try to pray. And then she would say, okay, now you're going to get this part, and I'm going to get this part. What we want to do in the church, just listen to this, what we want to do in this church is we want to have one part harmony. We want everyone to think like we think, to teach like we teach, to be like we are. And if no one else, if, is, then they're wrong and we're right. One part harmony is not unity. We find this in giftings in the body of Christ. I want you just to listen to me. I know I just have you for a few more, few, few more moments. We do this in the body of Christ. Um, one of my giftings is shepherding. I'm a pastor. You'll, you'll find me on Sunday mornings running my little legs around making sure everyone in the, in the room here feels like they're welcome to the best of my ability. Now, those of you that come in 10 minutes late, I'm not going to mention any names, Jamie, or um, some of the crew up here, or the trues up there. Hey, guys, you guys are here. I see you. Paul ducked behind the pew back there. Um, I can't get to you guys because you guys don't show up on time. But if you guys showed up on time, I would totally give you a hug and love on you, but I'll, I mean, I'll race around here. You'll see me like a chicken with my head cut off. I'll try to, I'll try to hug people and fist bump and uh, there's awkward moments and there's, you know, it's just, 
this pastor side of me. But if I feel like everyone needs to be like me, that is one part harmony. There are other people that your gift, I mean, for you to think that if you had to come to church and run up and down the aisles and pews and hug people, you'd be like my wife. My wife is an introvert and she would be like, I am not going to that church because I just, I just, it's just not in my person. But, but some of you are, have that teaching gift and that teaching gift is, is, is line by line, precept upon precept, that fivefold ministry gift. But what we do in the body of Christ is we have the church in town that has all the teachers. We have the church in town that has all the pastors. We have the church in town that has all the prophetic we have the church in the town that has all the evangelists. And what we do in the body of Christ is we practice one part harmony. And one part harmony is not unity. We are never going to see God use us as a, as a kingdom body in Grants Pass and Josephine County until me as a pastor looks at the strength that's found in the teacher and says, brother or sister, I need you right next to me because we are going to complement and when people come into the church and view us, they're not going to view us individually as a full and complete healthy body until we learn how to cooperate and work together in, to, in togetherness. Because why? Listen to me. One part harmony is not harmony. So if I only go to a church, and, and, and I only go to that church because I like the way that they sing a song, or I like the way that the, the pastor communicates, or I like the way that this person, if, if, if my frame of reference is, only what I like, when I like it, and how I like it. In the body of Christ, we're only practicing one part harmony. And what Peter is saying is, is if you want to have a healthy church, allow the giftings in operation to come, and don't say to the foot, there's something wrong with you. Don't say to the hand, there's something wrong with you. Don't say to the, the person's forehead, there's something wrong with you. Learn how to walk in unity. Yeah, come on, give the Lord a big round of applause. Hallelujah. I can't wait for the day. This, this first couple years, I felt like it was important for me to be in the pulpit quite a bit because you need to know your pastor's heart. You need, you need, to, have, you need to have me up here and, and sharing my heart and my life. But I can't wait for the day when I can come and sit on that front row and share different kinds of giftings on where we can have someone that has a prophetic leaning get up here and, and, and watch God use them mightily and a teacher that can come and exposit the word of God and, and do what 1 Peter 2.15 says to do in apologetics and give a reason. for. I cannot wait till the church at large can understand that in and of your gifting or your talents or your abilities, you, not, you do not possess all of the answer for all of the kingdom, but it's when you come together in unity that the word of God is preached and performed in power. So one part harmony can never be harmony. Look to your neighbor and say, one part harmony can never be harmony. One part harmony can never be harmony. If every one of you, if everyone was, was you or like you, unity can never be achieved. Um, there was uh, these two great awakening preachers that I, I heard a story about that was pretty powerful. They went to Bible college and seminary together. As I'm standing here today, I'm not actually sure who it was, but it was like Whitfield and Wesley. It was one of those guys, giants of the faith, that they went to Bible college around the same, seminary around the same time, and they had such a deep bondness and friend, friendship with each other. And one of them, there's actually a letter written one to another, and one of them was opining about their relationship because the more they studied the Word of God and the more that they disagreed, the more their relationship became fractured. And historians have this letter that is very powerful because one of the, one of the um, preachers turned into an evangelist and he would go to these communities and really incite a revival in a good way and people would come save. And another person had this gift of teaching and, and, they, and they clashed. And the evangelist wrote to the teacher and said this, which is so powerful. He said, you know, the, more, the, the less that we knew, the more that we loved. The less that we knew, the more that we loved. And somehow there's this knowledge that comes into the church as you walk into faith that you become convicted about your thing and the way that it should be done and not seeing the value that an evangelist plays in the church, not seeing the value that a pastor plays in the church, not seeing the value of what a teacher plays in the church. And you have to be careful. Listen to me. 
that the more that you perceive to know, the less love you have. No, the matter of fact, the more that you know that you're walking close with the Lord is the more love that you show, not the more knowledge that you have. That's a good word. YouTube is full of these people that will criticize other believers and other colleagues and other pastors and other churches. If the more knowledge that you have, the less love that you have, may I just lightly submit to you that there might be something wrong with your knowledge. If at the end of the day, your knowledge leads to more division and more infighting and more envy, you're not walking towards health, you're walking more towards the faithful five. And the kind of body that God is calling us to, please listen to this. Some of you guys, this is your first Sunday here, and you're coming in and, and being a part of a family conversation this morning. But I want you to listen to this pastor's heart. What God is calling us to is that the more that we know about him in demonstration and through his word, the less divisive we come and the more love that we have. To be like-minded in unity. To be sympathetic. Brooke, would you come back to the keyboard this morning? To be sympathetic to have a fellow feeling, mutually, mutually feeling, having compassion for one another. I don't know about you, but there's nothing like knowing that you have people behind your back no matter what in life you face. The third thing Peter says is to love one another. We, we taught a lesson several months ago about the, the different kinds of loves mentioned in Scripture. This love is Philadelphia's love or, or brotherly love. A bond that is like so close-knit, it's like your brothers. May, may I lightly suggest that brothers fight for sure, but true brothers, there's a loyalty and a bond that cannot be broken. My older brother, man, he's my hero. If you've never met my brother, he'll, he usually comes up every other, other, other weekend to come and support. You know, Chase is his son, Leanna, um, his, do, his daughter-in-law, his grandkids are up here. He's got Chloe, his daughter, he comes up and makes a drive every other week. So last, last week, he, he texted and said, Jay, I, I don't even know why, but I feel like I'm supposed to, to give you something. And um, I said, Steve, you don't need to give me anything. He goes, no, I just felt like I just want you to know as my older brother, as your older brother, that you, you are loved and I, and I believe in you. There is nothing like when brothers brothers lock arms and, do, and, and, and desire to do something great for God, that is the kind of bond that the church is supposed to have. Where when you look to the person to the left or right of you right now, it's like, those are my people. That if I mess up, they're not going to put me to shame. They're going to pick me back up. That when I'm in the hospital, they're going to come visit. When I'm, when I'm down financially, they're going to give. When I when I, when I have a promotion at my job, they're not going to be envious. They're going to cheer me on. The world is waiting for a church to walk in health to where, where when, when Bear and Ricky succeed and when Jason and Crystal succeed and when, when CW and the Ranger program is going crazy, that we're not looking at that as envious, but we're saying, go get them. Do everything that God's called you to do. The world is clamoring for the kind of example that the church is supposed to bring that we are to walk in this brotherly love. We're supposed to be compassionate. We're supposed to be humble. Let me give you three, three signs as we close this morning that you're walking in the healthy five. Number one, your reactions, your actions, your words are aligned in direction towards Jesus and love for others. I need you to just to, to, first sign that you're walking towards the healthy five. Your reactions, your actions, and your words are aligned in directions towards Jesus and love for others. If you hear gossip and slander, your reaction is going to tell a lot about if you're walking towards the healthy. Lord, I want my reaction, my actions, and my words to be aligned in my direction for love for Jesus and love for others. This is what 1 Peter 3, 9 and 11 says. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. 
They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Lord, I want my reactions and my actions and my words to be in line with my love for Jesus and my love for others. A second sign that you're walking towards health. There will be a healthy separation from those who don't align with him towards you. One of the biggest misnomers in, in the world today is that the church separates themselves from the world. It's actually the exact opposite. When you start to walk in the will of God for your life, you'll have friends that are around you that will leave relationship with you because your life convicts them and they have to run from it. Listen to what 1 Peter 3, 13 through 16 says. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But when people separate themselves from you, listen to this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Because as a Christian and as a believer, if you're, listen to me, if your life and the very presence of Jesus in your life is not convicting those that are around you, there might be something wrong with your walk and your health. Number three, we'll close with this. The third sign that you're walking in health is persecution will come to the obedient, but so does supernatural protection. Um, I shared this a little bit last week, and we'll close with this. Um, in, in the body of Christ, you got to pick your heart. you got to pick your heart. My, my son, my youngest son, my oldest son was a phenomenal athlete, is a phenomenal athlete. My, my youngest son, Jace, is a, a phenomenal athlete. And every time we join a sports team, I have to have the same conversation with the coach. Like, my kid's not going to miss Sundays. He's not going to miss Wednesdays. We're making a priority as a family to, to make church and the things of God a priority. And that's good if you're, it, you know, it's acceptable if your kid's bad, but if your kid's like the, the good player on the team, there's almost like this, this guilt trip that happens. It's the weirdest thing. And we have to have the same conversations over and over again with, with, with coach. Listen, listen to me, just listen. It's not easy to try to teach my son that the church is, a respons is responsible for him not being able to play sports all the time. You know, he plays a lot of sports. But I gotta pick my heart as a dad because if I don't establish the importance of a relationship with your heavenly father and you don't uh, establish the importance of being faithful to church, one day down the road, I'm gonna have to pick my heart with him when he wants to run from the church. You listen into it? You gotta pick your heart. I would rather pick the heart in standing for God and for his principles and for his kingdom and looking my son Jason in the eyes and saying, son, we're gonna do what, what Daniel and the three Hebrew children did. We're not gonna eat of the king's meat. We're gonna separate ourselves from the world and we're gonna, we're gonna be men of God. We're gonna take a stand and we're gonna watch the world around us look at our kids and go, how are they so successful in what they're doing when they're not doing it like the world? That is the secret sauce of being part of the kingdom of God is that you're not missing out on it. The world will tell you that you're missing out on it and you're not missing out on it. And you have to pick your heart. Could you, could you please hear this pastor's heart? You gotta pick your heart. I, I wanna pick the, I, I, want my, I want my two boys to serve God all their days. I pray, I pray a prayer of blessing over them almost every night when I, when I walk by their bedroom. When Jaden is he's getting older, I don't crack his door because I don't want him to, to feel like I'm, I'm stalking him. But I, I mean, I'll, I'll be outside of his door and I'll be praying, Lord, I'll be like, Lord, would you touch that young man? God, let him know that, that he can have ups and downs in you, but never ins and outs. Lord, over, over the children of this house, over the young people, the young adults, let them know that they can have ups and downs in you, but never ins and outs. To, to establish it, to say, Lord, we're gonna, be, we're gonna be healthy. Many of you guys have been in church for a long time and you remember what it was like to be part of a healthy, healthy congregation. 
the church that I grew up, man, like, like it was our family. Church is our family. You guys remember that? You remember that? You remember where we would come together more than an hour and 20 minutes on a Sunday morning? Do you remember? Do you remember where on Sunday nights we'd show up? Do you remember on Wednesday nights when we would show up and then we, we started with these, these, new, these new mechanisms and programs and Sunday nights gave way to life groups and care groups or small groups and those small groups began to wane out? And we didn't, we didn't go back and fix a problem. We just ran away from fellowship and we got more isolated. Do you remember that? Remember how we started saying yes to every ounce of overtime and every everything in the, in the and, and we stopped having Wednesday nights because it was just too busy? Do you remember, do you remember that? Because I remember that. And what the Lord, listen to me, what the Lord is doing, I don't even know why I'm ranting right now. What the Lord is doing is there is a, there's a call. There's an invitation to get back to health. There's, there's a call to lock arms with brothers and sisters once again. There's a longing to spend time with him. Because, listen, you're never going to find health being isolated. You're never going to find health. Just, just coming to church one hour and 15 minutes a day and letting your pastor just give you a 20-minute, like, in, just, just an encouraging thing without actually challenging you to say you're going to make it. You guys are going to make it. I'm so glad to see you guys here, by the way, this Sunday. You guys are going to make it. God's got you. I know when you start stepping this, this Christian walk out, the enemy wants to come and try to attack you, but man, you're going to make it. God's got you too. I mean, the transformation that's happening in your life right now, the devil can't stop it. It's like a snowball going downhill. Ain't going to stop it. Would you guys mind doing me a favor just right where you're sitting? Just stretch up your hands towards heaven. Would you, would you do that? Lord, I pray for those two right there. Hedge of protection around them. They've said yes to you, and the enemy's been trying to, to bring thoughts and lies against them. But Father, we thank you that they are not just conquerors, they're more than conquerors. And there's a church that's, that's going to walk with them through the ups and the downs. And Father, we're praying that there's going to be no ins and outs. We thank you that you're keen, and when you do it, you do it. You transform it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 This pastor loves you. We're walking. God's doing something. I can't like put all my hands to it. I can't, I can't explain it. But man, to be a part of, of a healthy body of Christ that is moving forward in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hey, before we walk out that road and we go to our mission fields, would you guys stand up across this auditorium? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By the way, Jamie and Nick, forgive me. Paul and Francie, forgive me. I wasn't calling you guys out, but I was calling you guys out. You're loved. Man, you're loved. This phrase came into my heart last year. These are the good old days. We're going to remember when God cracked our back and caused us to be stand up straight again. What a family we're a part of. Mark, what a, what a family. We need to pray for Chad. Mark, come grab this microphone. Let's pray for Chad really quick. Chad's been in and out of the, out of the hospital. I'm sure, he's, I'm sure he's watching. Would you just pray for Chad really quick? just excited to see Lord God that in the first place things were not looking good for him and we prayed for that abscess to be able to shrink Yes. and now we just pray for it to disappear in Jesus name we recognize the authority that you have given us that we now are the body of Christ Yes. and all power and authority that was put under your feet Jesus and now you have transferred that authority to us to be able to call yes. things out in Jesus so right now in Jesus' name, once again, whatever is out of alignment, 
Uh, we speak alignment in Jesus' name. We speak life and light. Your word says that you are the light of the world, yes. that out of, out of you and now out of us flows rivers of living water, and you are the bread of life, and we speak life and light into Chad's body right now in Jesus' name. We command your body, Chad, in Jesus' name yes. to be healed yes. by the stripes of Jesus. You are healed, and we claim it in yes. Jesus' name. We're just going to flow here for a minute. Um, could I have some women of God stand next to Ayla? And I want some men of God to stand next to Dawson. Um, their family has just been under attack. And uh, we're going to be a family today. Is that okay? We're going to pray a prayer of protection and blessing over you two. We're going to pray that God's hand continues to remain upon you. This church is proud of you two. We're thankful that you guys have been faithful. We're thankful that you guys, that you guys have stand. And I, I gave you a specific word earlier. God's got you. He's got you. He's got you. You understand? Uh, where, where's Justin? Justin, he's in with the middle school. Chase, come here. Why don't you pray over these, these two? Would you stretch your hands towards them right now? Father, God, we just take this moment, and God, we'd be able to lift this entire family up to you. That, Father, that you've got a great calling and a great plan on each and every one of their lives. And so, Father, anything, any attack that is coming from the enemy, God, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. That, God, that you've already declared victory over this family. You've already got a great calling and a plan and a purpose for them. And so, Father, we just pray and lift them up right now. That, Father, you give them peace. You give them strength. That, God, that every individual, God, that is going to ever cause any sort of ripple inside each and every one of this family's lives, that, God, that you would just give them the anointing, and God, let them know that you've got them in the palm of your hand. And that, Father, that these individuals are going to be world changers, planet shakers in Jesus' name. And that, Father, that ultimately, God, you know exactly, exactly, exactly what these individuals need. And so, Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit. We pray for an overflowing over them, that, God, that they would be filled up so much that way they could be able to go out, God, and know that you have victory and victory for each and every one of them. And so, Father, right now, God, we just lift up this the Grace family yes. as a whole. God, we pray for Dawson and Ayla specifically, that, God, that you have them in the palm of their hand. And so, Father, God, we just lift them up. God, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Man, you can stay there, ladies. You can stay there. We're just going to be a big family. If you have a specific word or just want to give them a hug, you're more than welcome to. I want to challenge you just before we leave. Um, We got to respond this morning. And we got to respond in such a way that's appropriate for, for the health that God's bringing us into. And I know it's going to make some of you uncomfortable, but at this point, I think you guys trust me. Um, you're going to look to the person to the left or right of you. Maybe you know them, maybe you don't. Um, but I'm going to ask you to try to find that person that God's going to highlight to you and ask, how can I pray for you this morning? Because I believe, I believe what the Lord is doing is he's setting our sight not on what's happening on just the inside of us, but lifting our sight to what's happening with the brothers and sisters that are around us. And so I'm going to give you 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I want you to ask your neighbor. I want you to, to go and, and just say, what can I pray with you about before we leave this service today? And then my wife is going to lead us in a song. Just ask. Yes. take 60 or 90 seconds and I just want you guys to pray. Lord, would you touch?
We thank you for what you're birthing in this place. All for you, all for your glory. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. We'll see you guys tonight. Prayers, 5 o'clock, Fellowship Hall.